Hi, I'm Michael Asker, and today I'm here with my guest, James Edmondson, who's a doctor, but also a parent of disabled children. And we're going to talk about some of the issues that he's encountered. Hi, James. How are you mm -hmm. today? Very good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's very interesting in you explaining that you were a neurologist for many years, mm -hmm. and you never heard about the OPWDD, which is the uh, organization which provides services, mo the main organization which provides services to disabled people, um, until you had children with autism. True. And so even a doctor who's dealing with neurological conditions, you weren't aware of the services available to people with neurological conditions. Um, so, yes, I was um, trained at some of the best places in New York City. Mm -hmm. I went to medical school at NYU, and then I did pediatrics at Einstein, and then in child neurology training at Columbia. Um, and um, then I worked at, at HIP, mm -hmm. uh, and I should have heard everything there is about my field in that amount of training. You would think, yeah. Um, but the doctors sort of focus on things they can actually impact and make a difference with. So that means prescribing drugs or doing surgeries, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we make a distinction between a, a condition that's treatable or that's progressive, and doctors are interested in that, uh, versus something that's static or stable. So if there's, if there's some disability, uh, say the uh, development of some part of the brain uh, was you know less than what it normally is, um, but you can't change it. Mm -hmm. It's it's a done deal, right? Then doctors uh, seem to have less interest, and um, also the health healthcare is sort of very insular. So you know if you're in a hospital or you're in a clinic, you're dealing with that and. It's unfortunate the few doctors really look too far into the community itself. So, so when you had your kids, could you tell us about how you found out they were autistic and how, as right. a doctor, that? Um, well, the yeah, what does autism look like in an infant? Um, there are what we call developmental milestones. Everyone knows you, know, you have a baby and they sit up around six months mm -hmm. and they stand up around 12 months say their first words, they may put a couple of words together by 18 months, say a simple sentence by age two, some of them speak a lot by age two, right? So any child who's not sort of on that pathway and on target, um, then you begin to wonder why is that? Mm -hmm. um, and so our son Alexander, we have two sons mm -hmm. who, who are diagnosed with autism, um, neither one of them really said words until they were two, two and a half even one word, right? Mm -hmm. um, our younger son, Eric, um, didn't say anything until he was three. And then all of a sudden, he would say rather complicated words, you mm -hmm. know, sort of, it, it, which surprised us. And we learned that, that they could understand and they knew how to spell words more than they could speak. So the way I look at autism um, as, a, as a disorder, it's sort of like there's a bottleneck, right? So we have a brain that perceives the external world and generates an internal model, and this allows us to predict. And that's how we operate in the world. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a, a, an efficient flow of information of the external world to the internal world and back out. Mm -hmm. And we sort of take that for granted. Mm -hmm. But somebody in autism, one of their problems is that it's, it's, not, a, it's not efficient. Mm -hmm. It's a bottleneck where there's a very small number of ways that they can sort of take the information in, mm -hmm. and similarly, a small number of ways they can take in, they can send information out. Mm -hmm. So they may want to say something rather complicated, but the final common pathway is narrowed down to something that's very um, limited, mm -hmm. and it makes it difficult for them to communicate, and it makes it difficult for them to take information in rapidly or at even at what we would call real time, mm -hmm. normal pace. Mm -hmm. So our Alexander. You have to present information very simply to him, mm -hmm. one step at a time, break things down, uh, do it simply, repetitively, and so on. When it finally gets in, he never forgets it. Mm -hmm. It's there, and he can, he can tap into it. Um, 
So the, 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 the strategy that really works best for people with autism is to break things down and to slow them down into um, you know, little steps, sort of baby steps, your whole life. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, now I'm just curious because I have a lot more, like we were talking before, uh, I have a lot more experience with mobility impairment mm -hmm. because that's what I live with uh, at home. And um, I don't know, now is there a, can you diagnose autism through a test or, I mean, is there a- Right, is there so there, right. What are if, the markers? If, if, yeah. yeah. If somebody comes into my office, mm -hmm. you know, just in my interaction with them, I will quickly perceive mm -hmm. that they have autism. And I can sort of say, you know, in five minutes, yeah, that person has autism. Um, and I could write that on a prescription if, if they need it. Uh, why do you want to know if a person has autism? Well, mm -hmm. partly is the family, you know, wants, the, uh, wants some sort of explanation mm -hmm. for why the kid looks different from other, right? So it, it helps them. Because this is my, this is the biggest thing I wanted to, to say. Um, there's a lot of stigma involved mm -hmm. with this, you know, being different in any way. There's a there's a lot of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's cultural. Mm -hmm. so, so some cultures are a little worse at this, and some cultures are a little more accepting of it. Um, but uh, so I think one of the things that providers can do is to provide an explanation mm -hmm. and a way of looking at the child. So you don't you're not looking at the kid if you say. Uh, Johnny, go run upstairs and, and wash your face, and he just stares at you, mm -hmm. right? Then, um, uh, you know, some people's reaction might be, you know, he's not listening, or he's trying to be stubborn, right? Or he's, you know, resisting me, or in, in some way or another, they, they put an interpretation that's really probably not fair mm -hmm. to the child. And if instead of that, you can replace that with, he's just not processing what you said. You know, you have to say it slowly. Mm -hmm. Johnny, first, let's go upstairs, mm -hmm. right? And you may have to follow him upstairs. And once he's there, mm -hmm. now you say, okay, let's go wash the face, right? Mm -hmm. I think you should assume people want to be cooperative and helpful. Okay, but right? well, why I'm curious about a physical marker, you know, like if you could say, look at a brain scan or a blood test or something. Right, so. That, so because when you go to apply for services. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that. Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. So, right, so one reason is to explain to families. Right. Another reason, of course, is, as you say, to get services. Right. And the dynamic there is that there's taxpayer money or some money coming from somewhere right, that's in a pool that has to go, is supposed to be targeted to the most needy mm -hmm. members of society. That's our sort of social contract, right? And so you have to triage and allocate resources based on need, mm -hmm. right? So you want to quantitate. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if a person is a dwarf, for example, right? You mm -hmm. can say, well, you know, they're the only this tall. Mm -hmm. Right, that's a physical right? marker, right? There are numbers you can attach to it, right? And there's and um, it, for example, with cerebral palsy, it's often very obvious that the person doesn't move normally, right? And you can quantitate that to some degree, right? Well, the spasticity um, of the muscles or the range of motion can be, yeah, I've seen them do these kind of analysis. So, but people can have fairly severe autism that impairs their functioning and they look fine. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, are quite attractive, mm -hmm. right? So you can't really use that and there's no blood test mm -hmm. for it, right? And there's no marker on brain scans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's no genetic test for it. Mm -hmm. You may read in the papers every now and then they found this genetic marker for it. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful with those kind of things because that really only, you have to say what was the population they were looking at. And it may be a genetic marker somehow statistically popped up in that particular population, but it doesn't represent the rest of the world. So it's so not, okay. They're all, there's a huge difference. People say, if you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism, because they're all a little bit different. Um, so I put that lingerie on because Joe's coming over. And that's it. Because it's, it's your right to have this sexual experience, even if you need someone's help to, to get to that place. If you feel more comfortable with um, that person holding the mic asking your question, feel free to kind of relay that. I'm somebody who suffers from severe um, social anxiety. I suffer a lot from conversation openers. We, we, we hold people on the spectrum and with other to higher standards we hold ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's like sometimes you can I curse but sometimes you just want to you know? <laughs> <laughs> When we talk about sexuality, especially with autism, not just safety, not just keeping people safe, but empowering people.
teaching them about their bodies, about what they like, so they're not relying on others for that and getting into potentially dangerous situations. It, it forces you to uh, not follow the script, which is so fun and enlightening. Growing up, I really didn't have anyone to ask advice to, and I, it can, and so at that time I was also heavily into Sex in the City, and I was thinking, where's my Carrie Bradshaw, but in a wheelchair? Like, how, how do you um, tell your home attendant, or how, how do you get intimate with someone when you need help to maybe change into a piece of lingerie, or like, position yourself in bed. For a lot of folks on the spectrum, one of the barriers can be sensory issues. You know, people don't like to be touched or issues with certain types of touch or, you know, that, that you know, the, the intimacy in, involved in that can be overwhelming. You know, so say you can't do penis and vagina. Like, you can have sex in tons of other ways and people don't know that. I interviewed someone who had learned to have orgasms through their earlobe being touched, that you're sort of erogenous zones, that you can have sort of orgasmic energy from places that are not your vagina. Sometimes these forums that I know of about sex and disability are on websites that sort of cater to like BDSM and fetish and sort of non-traditional relationships, which I think is like probably a negative, but um, that you can find great partners through that. Workers or is being legalized here in the here in the states, or if it's not, or, or if it will never ever be. Uh, a sex surrogate is essentially someone, a, a sex worker who uh, enables somebody with a disability to have sex. All right, like someone yes. who right. it's, it's a medical. Really. Yeah, who has enough understanding? Who can, like you know, you said, like position someone on a bed that they want to, you know, the way that they want to be positioned or they can deal with a medical equipment. But in the U.S., it's, it's like, it's considered prostitution and illegal to pay for, for sex. So that's problematic because it can be a really helpful thing. Um, it's important to remember that it's not bad or sad to have an experience with a sex worker. I think that that's something that we really need to challenge. There's a whole other way to look at it. Like, this is a person who is there for you to learn. We need to start talking about this earlier and, and more openly and not having so much of, a, of a, a stigma just about sexuality. Right, now it's interesting what you're talking about because I was at the District 75 meeting mm -hmm. and if people who don't know the District 75 is sort of the special ed district it's it's all over New York in different schools and stuff and the um, one woman came up she was from Zambia and she said she, that they in Zambia nobody talks about autism and the kid wasn't talking and they said oh she'll talk in her own time but there was no effort to diagnose or help or treat early intervention because it's Zambia uh, so she came to New York and she was very impressed. And I was impressed with her that she was not ashamed of the thing or she didn't reject the diagnosis mm -hmm. um, and that she was actually coming to a meeting. There, you know, there are 24,000 kids in District 75. There were about 24 parents at the mm -hmm. meeting. But she came not to complain or ask questions, but just explain that she'd come from Zambia and she was pleased that there was this kind of... Uh, I think it's generally true that the services for awareness of autism and services for autism um, are the most advanced in the United States mm -hmm. compared to anywhere else in the world, mm -hmm. right? So she was uh, the the point oh oh one percent of Zambians with enough gumption to to not take what they were telling them and to come to the United States, and she had the uh, the means and. Well, I, so think, I think she came to the United States probably for her husband's work, not because she was looking for right. a cure. Uh, but when she got into the school system, they said, hey, this kid is, there's something you want to check, which she wasn't getting in, in Zambia. Now, which Or be, in, even in, in parts of Europe, Latin America, oh, right. in, in Asia, the awareness is very much lower 
Right. And even in, in the United States, I think New York State is among the best as far as recognizing and doing something. So what are these people considered if they're not autistic? Are they crazy? Are they just odd? I mean, what? And that's an interesting question. So um, the uh, special education federal law mm -hmm. was passed in 1975, and it's, it, it, it uh, gave a list of, of diagnoses, and autism was not on that list at that point, mm -hmm. right? So in those days, someone who we would today call autism would, would have, and then, and then in those days, uh, have been called mental retardation, is generally mm -hmm. what it would have been, mm -hmm. right? Or then they had um, pervasive developmental disorder was something like that, and it, it took some years to even get autism on the list. It wasn't until 1993 that um, uh, the uh, autism was added to that list, then, with the increased awareness and the diagnosis and so on, suddenly a lot of kids who previously had been called mental retardation, that came sort of out of favor, mm -hmm. right? And autism sort of increased. Mm -hmm. And so these lines sort of crossed. Now, so it, it's, it's the reason that people talk there's a, an epidemic of autism, it, you know, it seems to be on the rise. We mm -hmm. never used to hear about it, and now we hear about it so much and so on. It's, it's partially, I think, mostly because of this, this diagnostic uh, yeah, issues, right? Not not necessarily that more people of the pop, of the you know a higher fraction of the population is actually autistic. I mm -hmm. think those kids were always there. But the other thing is this has to do with the stigma. Um, families would, would keep them hidden. Mm -hmm. That you know the advice was if you would die, if you found a kid a child two or three years old you know that had some sort of developmental delay. Um, the advice until fairly recently was um, put them in an institution, mm -hmm. right? Keep them out of sight. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, right? Now, you know, people are a little more open about it. Mm -hmm. So you you see, and um, uh, making, uh, you know, making it known to the world that your child has autism is part of getting services and getting help for them to the schools. Mm -hmm. And there's, of course, the people that provide those services and encourage increased awareness, right? So the... Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, it, it's sort of synergistic, as, as and and one, you know, I guess consequence or benefit of all this is that more public money comes to provide services. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. But now, on your personal experience, so you still don't know about the services in the office for people with developmental disabilities, OPWDD. I'm trying to make like a ban on acronyms and <laughs> initials i'm thinking of even getting a buzzer so because like when amber was here there was you know, it depends different people talk about it. but I, I think that one thing that scares people is the when you get into this world they start talking about msc coos slps and i don't think that that's good for people because it, it makes it harder for them to keep track of what's going on but so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about Okay, you have your beautiful kids, and then suddenly you think mm, maybe something's not right. And then, how did it lead you to becoming aware of the services? Um, well, we weren't perhaps completely ignorant because in pediatrics, we we um, there's a, a pediatrics is a medical specialty, and there's a subspecialty called developmental behavioral pediatrics mm -hmm. um, that is required in our training mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, it's related to child neurology. It's not. It's a, neurology is one specialty. Psychiatry is a specialty. And developmental behavioral pediatrics is a specialty. And those are the three main medical specialties that tend to uh, take an interest in helping people with autism. Um, so we knew of well, as far as getting services um, at age zero to three, there's something called early intervention. Mm -hmm. So you can contact an early intervention agency, mm -hmm. say, I suspect that my child has this, or sometimes the doctors would do that, and I often gave a phone number to people to call up. Mm -hmm. right? um, this is a government-funded at, at quite a good rate, and the agencies are often very eager to, to come out and see if they can um, help. So they sent somebody out to do an evaluation to look at Alexander. Um, and they, um, strangely, they said, "Well, we don't think that he's all he's all that abnormal, you know, mm -hmm. at 18 months." And and I think there was some denial, even in, in my wife's a physician, I'm a physician, mm -hmm. but I think so. We really didn't get much in the line of services until we came back when he was three years old and still hadn't made the the, the uh, milestones. Um, and um, uh, the the tree, the best recognized therapy to help people with autism 
is a therapy that, as I said before, it breaks things down into task analysis and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, it's called applied behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, there are many, many therapies out there, and uh, there's many ways of doing each one of them. Uh, and some people have had good experiences with them, and some people have not had good experiences with them. So it wouldn't be hard to find someone and say, oh, ABA, that's terrible. Right? Mm -hmm. But there, I, we happen to think it's, it's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, um, you know, fortunately, we had the... the, the but, but when did you find, like, okay, because the OPWDD is a complicated process. You have to go to a front door. Right. And, and then you have to... They give you like a pile of literature and say, find some uh, Medicaid service coordinator, which they're changing now, but, and mm -hmm. you call these numbers and they don't answer you. There's a, 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 right, a, I recall, yes. Um, so, so, I just, so when did you find out about uh, Medicaid waiver services? Well, the early intervention didn't tell us this. Okay, that's interesting. The, um, we you think that they would be the logical bridge to it, wouldn't they? Mm. Let's, let's just, you have some numbers in an email you sent me. You right. said that how many, so how many people get services? Through? So the, the, yeah, if we want to jump to the, the OPWD, the, the criteria for our entry there mm -hmm. um, is basically the lowest 2% of the population. Mm -hmm. So New York State's population is about 20 million. 2% mm -hmm. so of that is 400,000. Mm -hmm. So there, there ought to be in the entire state of New York roughly 400,000 people mm -hmm. who Receive service. Who, who potentially could qualify for the LPWDD. It's a Medicaid waiver, so-called. Right. It's a part of Medicaid. Um, uh, I was a, I, was, I worked at HIP not far from here, mm -hmm. um, seeing mostly um, city employees and then uh, Medicaid patients, um, a lot of them. But, but, but wait, you said so 400,000 mm -hmm. potentially would could receive services. Through. If they knew about it. Right. So how many do receive services? So the, the number, um, it's a little hard to get clear data. The, the OPWD says they care for 130,000 people in New York State. So that's okay, about so one third. Yeah. Right. Although I think it's really more like 100,000. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so it's between it's, a quarter and a third of people who potentially could be getting yes. help or not getting. So, so why aren't those people who aren't getting help? Why not? And, yeah. and I think, um, so I'm, I'm saying I, as a, a neurologist, I saw many people who, in retrospect, should have been getting services from the OPWD. I never once was given a form to fill out to, 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 you know, to help to get somebody in there, mm -hmm. right? Um, we had a very good social worker. She never mentioned it to me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, you know, the, so how do people find out about it? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. right? You're supposed to be finding about it in the school. So if you're in special education, the IEP rules say that when you turn 15, there's supposed to be discharge planning, mm -hmm. and there may be a transition coordinator, uh, and that person. So it, my son Alexander is in the District 75 school, right? And the schools will provide some amount of what it, of these kind of services that are to, until age 21, mm -hmm. and then you fall off the cliff, right? Right. 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 So the transition coordinator tries to get everybody into the OPWDD before the, the, the they turn 21, so that it's, at least they don't fall as far off the cliff, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think we did find out through his school. I think it was as soon as he he got into that school at age fourteen, and they met with us and they said you need to try to get him into the OPWD. I'm like, what's that? Right. <laughs> um, which, but then I quickly learned. But even so, it took us two and a half years. It took us five. To, so you know, to, yeah, to even get him into it. And yeah. even when I was applying for it, I wasn't really aware of how much we could potentially get. I thought yeah. that we could get some modifications to the house mm -hmm. paid for, of course, only after getting three bids and a, a sort of bureaucratic mm. process and um, some respite. And respite services to me seemed a little weird. It's sort of like we get somebody to come into our house and take care of my kid while I'm in the house. And yeah, uh, it's it helps a little bit, but now I've got a stranger in my house. You know, so I wasn't really... Well, the, the respite is, is sort of for the caregivers. Right. To think of how much, and there's another service called community facilitation that's right. for the person themselves. Right. right. So, but we didn't, it, nobody really explained this to us. And then like the word community habilitation is sort of, what does that mean? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even like with Nick, 
his his aides or personal care assistants or whatever you want to call them. There are other students mostly. There's one sort of professional, but mm -hmm. students who are doing it. They were having problems filling out the forms because they were calling themselves personal care assistants and they would reject it and say, no, you're a comhab worker. Mm -hmm. And why does, you know, this is, and this is sort of my problem with the absurdity of all. If the person wants to call themselves a personal care assistant, an aide, whatever, a care manager, whatever title they want, I don't really care. But they have to sort of fit into this. It's dizzying. Yeah. 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 So they may, so I'll tell you, I, I worked at HIP, which mm -hmm. was kind of the original managed care model, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I have a lot of experience. So it, there's good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, but it's appropriate for acute care medicine. So the, the business model is that you take 100 people, right? And each one of them is going to pay $1,000, you know, to, into a kitty, right? 90% mm -hmm. of them are not going to come to the doctor. So that's free money for the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other 10% are have needs. So you take some of that free money to help the people who don't, right? Mm -hmm. So you must have... A, a large fraction of your population that's never going to come and use the services, mm -hmm. and then managed care can work, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? This does not describe the OPWD because in the OPWD, 100% of people needs need services, needs, yeah. right? Where are you going to get your free money from? You, you're not going to get free money from, mm -hmm. right? So it's 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 dishonest to say that managed care is going to work in this population. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, <laughs> and uh, it's been very informative. And I now I do the TV magic right here, which is I got my own thing, and I say, okay, thank you for joining us on Ability Fierce. I had Dr. James Edmondson, and it was a very informative chat. This is our fourth show. Uh, we were supposed to premiere last night, but there were some technical difficulties. So we're airing again next Monday at 8 o'clock, I believe. Well, that's this is in TV time. We're going back. Um, next week, I have Cheryl Lynch, who is the mother of an autistic child, and she writes uh, some essays about the situation. She was nice enough to send me a book. Um, she reached out to me after I made a big speech about um, how the uh, bureaucracy was impacting on families and how we need to um, stop this. And she was touched by what I said and came up to me and then she sent me this book. So we're going to talk to her about her experiences with her autistic son, Daniel. And um, she's uh, African-American, so I want to see a little bit of the different perspectives um, that you get across the cultural divide. I've talked to some people, asked them to come in. Um, the woman from Zambia, for instance, I reached out to her and her husband. I hope they come in because I'd like to see the difference between disabilities in uh, the so-called first world and in the uh, so-called third world. And um, you know, and again, if you, you know, reach out, talk to us, if you have any ideas, if you have anybody, you, if you want to appear on the show, or you know anybody who you think would be good, we're very open to it. The idea is just to open up the discussion, show what's going on, and change it and make it better. So thank you. Mm -hmm.